In lesson 5.2 on page 281 in your workbook, we'll be looking at congruent triangles. So if two triangles are congruent to one another, that means they have exactly the same shape and size. So all of the corresponding parts of those triangles would be congruent. All of the corresponding angles would have the same measure and all of the corresponding sides would have the same length, same size and shape. We can use rigid transformations, one or a series of them, one after the other, to move one triangle on top of, to superimpose, on top of another triangle and show that it's a perfect fit. In doing so, we are physically showing that those triangles are congruent to one another. So if you know that triangles are congruent, you therefore know that all of the corresponding parts are gonna be congruent in those triangles. The corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent to each other, and the shorthand abbreviation for that is CPCTC. And we'll use that a lot um, eventually when we start doing proofs with respect to these. So show that these polygons are congruent by identifying the corresponding congruent parts. Well, you can see that we have one, two, three, four pairs of angles that have all been labeled congruent and ticked accordingly over here. So A was congruent to W. They each had a single tick mark. D was congruent to Z. Looks like D has four tick marks and so does Z. It gets kind of hard to do if we were doing that by hand. Same thing is true with the segments. For instance, segment DA in this polygon is marked with three and ZW is also marked with three. So because all, all four angles and all four pairs of sides are congruent to one another, then we know that those two polygons are congruent. And notice that when we name the polygons, we match up the parts. So for instance, C is the third letter and Y is the third letter. If I look at angle C and angle Y, I can see that they've been marked the same. They're both congruent to one another. Likewise, A is first and D is last. W and Z are in the same position here. Segment AD, AD is congruent to segment WZ with three markings, okay? So the way the polygons are named is important. All right, so how could we show that these polygons are congruent and which ones are congruent? Well, notice everything's already been marked for us over here. So P has the single mark. It has to be congruent to angle G. Q is marked with the double, so that would be F. R triple to triple, that would be E. S has the four markings, and the four markings here is angle D. Side PQ is the single tick mark, and so is side GF. Uh, the double is SP, the double over here is DG. Uh, the double here is R, sorry, the triple is RS, and that matches with DE in this polygon. And then finally, um, segment SP has double markings, and that's gonna mark with DG. I think I did one wrong, I'm sorry. I said QR incorrectly, didn't I? QR is marked with three markings. It's gonna match up with EF, segment EF. So PQRS is congruent to, well, P was congruent to G, that comes first. Q matched up with F, F comes second. R matched up with E and S matched up with D. So the polygon has to be named in that order. So once you know that triangles or polygons in general are congruent, then you know that all the congruent parts match up. I always trust this congruency statement over the drawing. Sometimes the drawing can um, almost trick you a little bit. So what do we know? We wanna find the values of X and Y. Well, let me just go ahead and start with X. I know that angle T is congruent to angle R because they both come first, but I don't have a measure for R. However, in this triangle, I know two of the three angles, and since this is 90 all by itself, these two angles need to total 90 degrees together, and that would happen if that was 12. These two are complementary. So if R is 12, 
I know that T also has to be 12 degrees. So X is 12. And then we want to find the value of Y. Well, Y is side RS. R and S are first and second. That's going to match up with side TV. Side TV is 24. So we'll set 2Y minus 1 equal to 24 down here and solve for Y. So if you add 1, it's going to be 25. Half of 25 when we divide by 2 is 12.5 for Y. All right, so same thing down here, only they're not gonna guide us as much. So we wanna find X and Y. Let's start with X. Notice that X is part of, it's an expression that expresses the length of side AB. Side AB is gonna have the same length as ED down here. It's gonna be 20. So three X minus 10 will equal 20. Add 10, three X equals 30. Divide by three and X is 10. And then Y is an angle measure. And notice that this angle is 36.87 degrees and that's angle D. And D is in the same spot as B. So B is gonna have the same measure there as well. Once again, we have a right angle. <coughs> so these two angles do need to be complementary. So we need to subtract 36 and 87 hundredths from 90. If we do that, that's going to leave us with 53.13 degrees. All right, moving on. So um, another way to decide if polygons are congruent, remember, is to see if you can use a rigid transformation to move one exactly on top of the other so that the corresponding parts match up. So are these two triangles congruent? Well, if so, if we could map X, Y, Z onto A, B, C, we could show that they were congruent. So we're gonna try and move this triangle over here specifically so that Y matches up with B and Z matches up with C and so on. So one of the ways they suggest that we do that is we want X to be up high like A is. So they want us to take this triangle and reflect it in the Y axis, sorry, the X axis. When you reflect over the X axis, it's the Y coordinate that changes signs. So the Y coordinate will change the signs, the X coordinate stays the same. Let's go ahead and plot that. So one, two, X prime is here. Y prime is at zero, negative two, and Z prime is over three, down four. So here's our triangle. And now it's oriented the same way as ABC. Now if we could just slide it over and up, we should be able to show that they are indeed congruent. And we're gonna use the translation with this vector. And remember that vector rule simply means you're gonna take the ordered pairs, subtract five from the X, that's a positive three, so we'll add three to the Y's. So if we do that, remember that X is gonna be mapped onto A. I'll just go ahead and say, hopefully this will be, it's really X double prime, but it should be the same thing as A, okay? Um, so let's subtract five from one, that'll give us negative four, add three to two, and that will give us five. And if you look, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, sure enough, that's where A is. Same thing here, we'll subtract five, negative five, and add three, that'll give us positive one. Negative five, positive one is B, and we wanted Y, Y to end up where B was. And then finally, subtract five there, and Z double prime would be at negative two, add three, and that would be at negative one. Negative two, negative one, sure enough. So by a series of transformations, we show that this triangle slides over and up, and then it ends up being an exact match. So we're gonna do the same thing down here. Are the triangles congruent? And if so, justify it using rigid transformations. Well, they look to be the same shape and size to me, but are there any of these transformations that will get the job done? 
So the first one says that you just can't do it. There's not a series of transformations. That might be the case, and I'm sorry I'm outside today so you can hear the birds and the cars. <laughs> um, let's go on and let's try B. So triangle LMN is congruent to PQR. So remember, that means we need to be able to get L in the same position as P. And um, let's work on moving LMN to PQR. So can we do it with a rotation that's set 270 counterclockwise about the origin and then follow it up with the reflection in the Y axis? So that's gonna be a series of transformations. I'm just gonna test L and then if L works, I'll test another point. Um, so the original L is over one up four. If we do a 270 counterclockwise rotation about the origin, that's the rule that says you switch out the X and the Y and switch the sign on the X as it goes to the back. So L prime would end up at four, negative one. Then we wanna reflect it in the X axis. Sorry, I keep saying that backward, in the Y axis. So that's the one where we're gonna change the sign on the X coordinate. So L double prime would end up at negative four, negative one. Well, negative four, negative one is right there at P. So L to P works. Let's go ahead, let's just pick another one, let's try N. Same thing for N. So the original N is on the X axis over four. If we use this rule, X goes to the back and switches signs, Y comes to the front and stays the same. So that's N prime and then in double prime, change the sign on the X, which I can't do since it's zero and keep Y. So zero negative four is down here on the Y axis. Um, and if we did the same thing for M to Q, it works as well. So we found a series of transformations that will prove congruency. All right, it turns out here's um, a theorem. Again, it's a little bit of a common sense theorem to me. If you have two angles in one triangle congruent to two angles in another, then automatically the third angles have to be congruent to each other. And that should make sense because if this is 70 and this is 80, those add up to 150. Since we're in a triangle, there is only one possibility for that third angle so that the whole thing will equal 180. So if you have the same two angle measures over here, then since they also have to add up to 180, these are forced to be congruent as well. So if two angles in one triangle are congruent to two angles in another triangle, then the third angles are automatically gonna be congruent to one another. You don't have to do the math to test it. Other properties that will hold true with congruence, with triangle congruency, is a triangle can be congruent to itself, the reflexive property. If you have a pair of congruent triangles, you can switch them around, the symmetric. And transitive, if we have three triangles, the first congruent to a second, and that same second congruent to a third, then we can skip over the guy in the middle and say the first is congruent to the last, the transitive property. And here they prove the symmetric property. We're gonna skip over that. Okay, so now we're gonna use the third angle theorem. And I'm not really gonna um, pay too much attention to what they have in the chart because I think we can answer the question maybe without overanalyzing it. So they tell us that um, angle ABD is congruent to angle CBD. A, B, D has B as its vertex. So these two angles are congruent. Um, we're gonna have an origami activity here. And they tell us that angle B, A, D is 58 degrees. And we wanna find the measure of angle C, B, D here. All right, well, we know that we've got a pair of congruent angles, a pair of congruent angles, two congruent angles. So by default, I know these third angles are gonna have to be congruent to each other. So this one is also 58. If I zoom in on this triangle, since this is 90, it's a right triangle, the remaining two acute angles have to be complementary. So we can just do 90 minus 58 in order to come up with the angle measure, which is gonna end up being 32 degrees, okay? The measure of BCD equaled 58 and CBD plus 58 had to equal 90 if you wanted to fill that in. But we came up with a 32 without too much 
too much. Okay, let's look at the next example. We've got a kite and we can see that we have a right angle here. So by default, this one's also a right angle since they're a linear pair. BAD is congruent to BCD, sees the vertex, BCD. So if those two angles are congruent, then remember by default, these remaining third angles have to be congruent as well. And they tell us that BCD is 45 and they ask us to find this one, ABD. Well, these are congruent to one another. We can find this angle because this is 90 degrees. These two are complementary. If that one's 45, this one has to also be 45 and those are congruent to one another. So the measure of ABD is also 45. All right, let's look at a couple proofs on this final page and then we're done. So um, they give us a two column proof. We're trying to prove that triangles are congruent, excuse me, congruent. So remember that means that all of the corresponding parts have to be congruent to one another, all the parts that match up. So they give us a lot of information. Angle J is congruent to angle P. Segment JK is congruent to segment PM. Segment JL is congruent to segment PL. And they go on to tell us that L, this point, bisects KM. So that means it cuts it into two equal pieces. I'll mark that in just a second. So they have listed all of the given information everything that we just, I just marked with my pen. And then they go on to say that JLK, which is this angle, is congruent to PLM. And we know that because they're across from one another on that X, they're vertical angles. Vertical angles are always congruent to each other. All right, then it goes on to talk about the fact that L bisects KM. If L splits this segment in half, then this piece has to be congruent to that piece. LK is congruent to LM, definition of segment bisector. That's what it means to bisect a segment. You split it into two equal pieces. Um, all right, there's some other things probably we could have done there. We could have said it was the midpoint and gone with the midpoint theorem, but let's keep going. Notice that we have two angles in one triangle congruent to two in the other. So that means that automatically the third angles will be congruent to each other. K is congruent to M. The third angles theorem are basically two congruent angles in two triangles. Is that what, if that's what you have, then the third angle is also gonna be congruent. So there you go, we've labeled all of the parts, the three angles and the three sides. So now we know for sure those triangles are congruent. And again, notice that when they wrote the names of the triangles, M and K were both marked with the triple markings and M and K are in the same spot. So be sure you match up those parts when you name the triangles. All right, so a quick paragraph proof. How can we show that these two triangles are congruent to each other? We've been given a lot of information. W, X, Z, which is this angle here, is congruent to Y, X, Z, which is this angle. Angle X, Z, W, this one, is congruent to X, Z, Y. We could prove those were right angles since they make a linear pair and they're congruent, but we won't need to do that. Segment WX is congruent to segment YX and segment WZ is congruent to segment YZ. Prove that the triangles are congruent. Well, notice we already have one, two, three, four parts and we're, every triangle has three sides and three angles, so we're only missing two parts. So they have all the given written, and then they're gonna go on to say, by the blank property, segment XZ is congruent to, they share that side, it's congruent to itself. And anything is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. So when they share a side or they share an angle, it's congruent in both triangles by the reflexive property. It's also given that we have a pair of angles and a pair of angles. So we know that that missing pair of angles, W and Y are gonna be congruent by the third angle theorem. The third angle in each of those triangles have to be congruent. So now that we've listed all six parts and we've got them marked in our triangle, we know that those triangles are congruent by definition of congruent triangles. Thanks for hanging in there. That was a long lesson.